Welcome to the Plumes of Oz. Today we're going to look at the Rufus Whistler, Packy Keffler, Packy Keffler Rufy Ventus. This is the opera singer of the bush. We may look at the Golden Whistler and think it's a spectacular bird, a lot of character, but this bird is the singer. In Australia we have nine Packy Keffler or Whistlers or some people would call them thickheads because Packy Keffler thickhead. In the world, there are 37 species of Pachycephala. Most of these are found southeast of the Wallace Line. In other words, on the Australian side of the Wallace Line. For you who don't know the Wallace Line, it was uh, given that name by Huxley, one of the biologists, in honour of Wallace. Wallace was a, a naturalist who came down from Malaya, coming down to Indonesia, and he was particularly interested in flowers, butterflies, and obviously wildlife as well. And he documented everything that he saw. When he got to Bali, he uh, got on a boat, which then took him across the strait between Bali and Lombok, which is 25 kilometers. And he had been hearing woodpeckers and babets in Southeast Asia, and seeing tigers and monkeys and rhinoceros, all the placental animals that we now still associate with Southeast Asia. So when he hopped off the boat into the surf at Lombok, walked up on the sand dune, he heard this raucous call. A honey eater. It was in fact a helmeted friar bird. And he couldn't believe it. The woodpeckers had gone. The babettes weren't there. The monkeys weren't there. There were no tigers when he walked around either. Went up to Sulawesi, found the same thing. Looked across the channel from Sulawesi to Borneo. Orangutans, monkeys, primates, placental animals. On the eastern side of the Wallace line, these animals did not exist. It's interesting with Wallace, he, he wrote a, a series of, of monographs or essays. One was entitled The Diversification of Nature. And he sent a copy of this to his good friend who was Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin uh, read this and thought, man, I've got to write this up. So he plagiarised it and really wrote it up as his own essay with his own signature. A year later, Darwin produced the origin of species. So you can see how Wallace was indeed, for his time, a revolutionary biologist. The Rufus Whistler is basically confined to mainland Australia with two exceptions. One is Melville Island and the other New Caledonia. So what we want to do today is introduce you to the Rufus Whistler. Packy Keffler, Rufy Ventus. For the most part, the Rufus Whistler is a mid and high canopy feeder, but here is an unusual case. Only 3-5% to of the time is spent foraging on the ground. Just to show how some of these films were obtained, we are going to go to the central tablelands, just on the western slopes, and here we have a hide set up. In fact, there are two hides, one on each side of this water hole. You can see one in the distance. And here, at this water hole, we have a female Rufus Whistler. And it wasn't long before the pair of them were there. The male on the left, the female on the right. Arachnids are also on the diet of this female Rufus Whistler.
This male Rufus Whistler is given a hard time by the honey eaters, but the honey eater migration was happening, and with all these white naped and yellow face, I wouldn't expect him to stand his ground. Here now, on the northern tablelands, this female Rufus Whistler is certainly a dominant bird. And now the male, the Fuscus honey eaters are about, and he is being chased from the waterhole. Because the honey eaters aren't in big numbers, he can stand his ground. Again at the waterhole, the male on the right, the female on the left, with thornbills and honey eaters coming in for drinks. Now we are photographing in the Kimberley region. Notice that this male doesn't have a black mark running behind his eye. This is called the black line and it is a way of distinguishing the nominate southern species from that found in the Kimberley. The Kimberley subspecies is called Falcata. Just watch how this Falcata, when he turns his head away from the shadow, you can see his face is more grey without the black line behind the eye. Again in the Kimberley, but I have trouble saying that this is a Falcata or the nominate subspecies. Another Kimberley bird, which for all purposes should be a Falcata, it has a very dark grey head, but certainly there is no black eye line. This bird is far more typical of the Falcata subspecies. Back in New South Wales now, and here is a typical nominate subspecies male. When he comes into the pool to have a drink, notice how the female shimmies her wings. This is a romantic gesture between the two birds. Here is an immature male. The lower black ring which circumnavigates around the white throat is not fully developed, but you can see that it's coming on. Another female. And again back at the drinking pond in New South Wales. These birds prefer open woodland areas, but they do like riparian areas close by. As you can see, they are quite addicted to water. This young bird has large stripes over the chest and it tends to have a little bit of rufous darkening. This is an immature bird and I cannot tell if it's male or a female. And the classical nominate species female. This clip was taken in summer. This female has a little bit of olive on the mantle and over the head. I suspect this reflects breeding mode because it also has increased rufus over the belly. The increased rufus over the belly is also a feature of the Kimberley Falcata bird. Here again is the typical female, Reefy Ventris.
Back in the Kimberley with the Falcata subspecies, notice the increased rufus over the belly coming right up to the chest. Back to New South Wales at our waterhole, and here you can see a male with a little bit of raggedy taggedy appearance. There are also some immature stripes persisting on the white throat. This suggests that this is an immature bird coming into its molt. It also illustrates nicely how the nominate subspecies has the black extending behind the eye. Now this photograph was taken west of Kunnamulla in western Queensland. The black is behind the eye, but look at the rufous belly. It's much paler than what we have been looking at. And this I find is a feature of the inland birds.